So, I heard you're considering sleep deprivation, social death, and depression. Nah, but for real though, IV students actually do have higher rates of depression. Fun fact to start the video on, isn't it? So fun. Anyways, sup humans, I hope you're feeling better than this terrible note that I just started the video on. My name is Zelda and I mostly make fashion content, but here and there I also make IV videos. For today, I thought I would discuss some pros and cons about IV to help you answer the question, is IV really worth it? I know I made a video like this a little over a year ago, but I forgot to include some information I really wanted to discuss, so we're making this one to replace the old one. If you need an intro for what IV is and how you're graded in IV, please check out the video linked here or in the description before you continue watching this video because I will be using some of the terminology and you might not understand it otherwise. I'm starting with my grades for context and also because people always ask me about them for some reason, but if you would like to skip this part or any other part, timestamps will be linked below as they always are. Without further ado, let us jump into this video. Okay, here are my grades and courses throughout all four semesters of IV. Note that mostly the grades here are predicted grades since my school didn't have a separate GPA from IV grades as some schools do. My school also doesn't predict EE and TOK grades until they're officially submitted to the IVO, which is why they're missing from the semesters one, two, and three. And the only reason I knew my predicted grade for the EE for semester four is because my teacher told me, which wasn't the case for my TOK grade. And therefore I also did not include that. It's also worth pointing out that I took economics under the anticipated category in May 2018. For my final EE and TOK grade, I received three points, making my overall score 41 out of 45, with a six in psychology as an additional subject. Moving on to pros about IV and why to choose IV. Generally, just by taking IV, you get a very kind, collaborative, and supportive community, which is so cool. I'm not saying you won't meet rude, condescending people at all because you meet those people everywhere. Nevertheless, I think the fact that students have a communal barrier to overcome makes them more inclined to help each other as they already understand the stress, which seems not to occur in equal measures in the other programs that I've seen personally. Whenever I meet someone who took IV, it's usually an immediate bonding discussion because people tend to have very strong opinions about IV and you skip a lot of the small talk by doing that. The common experience, like any other common experience, enables you to make connections faster and I think it allows you to talk about other topics more quickly in a very natural way. The community also expands across all sorts of platforms and countries and everything and if you ever have a question, there is either already a YouTube video or article written on it, or a Reddit user will probably be more than happy to answer your question. Also, if you just need some memes, Reddit my guys will get you through a lot. Would recommend. The Ivy Reddit is funny, okay? We got some good memes. Clearly I don't know how the community is in A-levels or AP or other high school programs that I didn't take, but I think the IV one is a pretty nice one. Moving on, you can select the classes that you would like to take, but simultaneously select the classes that you don't want to take by not choosing them. I think IV is quite similar to AP in the sense that you get to pick and choose the classes that you want to take. However, in the German high school program, while you do get some choice, you're also forced to take a bunch of classes many of which I personally wasn't very interested in and did not want to take. If you grew up in a similar school system, then IV is a very nice alternative because it allows you to niche down on your interests and focus all your energy on those courses. This actually brings me to my next point, which is that since you only take six classes typically, as well as TOK, you end up going quite deeply into the content and this allows you to explore the six classes that you take in more depth than you typically do for other high school diplomas. For example, you get to learn about color complexes and electron hybridizations in chemistry at a high school level, which you don't typically do. And you get to learn about avid stylets, which is like a weird detail that you also don't really need to know for biology, but that's super interesting. Overall, the content itself is insanely interesting, and even if your teachers are bad, you have some extremely well-written textbooks for the most part, so you can always read those if your teachers just suck a bit. <laughs> you also learn time management. I've personally always been a decently organized person, not to the point that I would say I'm organized, just like organized enough to submit my materials on time, you know? However, a lot of my friends vouch for this because they learned a lot of time management, so I thought I would throw this in here as well. I think a lot of the time management skills students learn is a result of having a lot of work cramped into very short periods of time. Most high school programs spread the workload across the entire high school experience. However, the majority of assignments that contribute to your final IV score 
are typically done in your final year, meaning you either learn to time manage or you drown. As dire as that sounds, it's kind of true and somewhat of a con in that sense as well. Moving on, we come to one of my favorite pros, namely people tend to be super self-motivated and independent. This is one of my favorite pros because it translates beyond IB onto people's extracurriculars and personal lives. If you're self-motivated, it's very nice being in an atmosphere like that especially as it's not particularly competitive for the most part. And in my experience, IB definitely self-selects for those characteristics a little bit. The last and arguably biggest pro is that IB is recognized by just about every single leading university on this planet, making it far easier to compare you as a university applicant to other university applicants. I think this is particularly beneficial for international students as admissions officers likely know absolutely nothing about your school unless you're some very prestigious school in your country, and they probably won't fully understand your school system, especially if it's one that's not fully standardized across the whole country, as is the case in Germany. Since IB is graded on a bell curve, it compares you to people from everywhere across the world, from all sorts of different school systems. If you score well in IB, it means you're competitive compared to a large group of people, and there's data to back that up, which isn't the case in school systems where you may only be graded in comparison to the other 20 kids in your class. Moving on to comp which we know there are plenty of. Firstly, you have reduced flexibility. Despite the large number of subject choices, there's less flexibility in the IB compared to a lot of other high school programs such as the AP. For example, this means you couldn't take chemistry, physics, and biology because all three sciences don't work in the group combination that you're required to take. You can technically request a special diploma, however, usually it's not worth it, and I don't know the amount of effort that goes into it, I only know one person that did it, and I'd never asked them about it, so I don't know. Moving on to the second con, if you're not a good exam taker, you're probably already at a competitive disadvantage. Think about it, roughly 80% of your grade for most classes is exams, and on top of that, you're being graded on a bell curve, meaning you're being graded in comparison to the entire cohort that is also taking exams with you. So for you to stand out at the top, you are no longer just competing against the 20 or maybe 50 other classmates you had in classes before, but you're competing against 200 to 300,000 other smart kids making it much harder for you to be the best and score the highest grades. Especially if you aren't particularly good at exams, aka the main component of your scores. In my opinion, something you should probably know about IB is that IB is likely going to be easier for someone who is naturally, naturally in quotation marks obviously, academically smart. I'm not saying you can't score well in IB if exams aren't your forte, and I also don't agree with the notion that you should only take IB if you've academically succeeded every single previous year of your life, because that's just losing an opportunity for growth. But the truth is IB will be easier for people that have academically succeeded in the past or at least generally it will, and they're generally going to be less stressed. I'm honestly not the best exam taker myself, so there was definitely a learning curve, but I adjusted, and a lot of other people I know who struggled with this also adjusted, and they ended up doing super well and often even scoring sevens in subjects that frustrated them the most. I'm not sure if you ever heard the quote, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, but I think it's very reflective of the situation. If you're not a good exam taker, you can definitely still score super, super well, but you're probably Probably going to have to work twice as hard to receive the same grade that everyone else gets with half the work. And I believe it's super important that you really consider thoroughly if you're willing to put in that effort before you commit to IB. Furthermore, you don't always get university credit, and this is one that I'm currently experiencing, which is rather annoying, honestly. <laughs> Particularly if you plan on attending university in the US, it's worth pointing out that more often than not, you will get more credit for AP classes than you will for IB classes, and many universities won't even give you IB credit, even for classes where you covered practically the same exact content as AP. Therefore, you might want to check the credit transfer system for each of the universities you plan on applying to. However, in general, if you're aiming to accumulate as much credit as you can before attending university, then honestly, AP is probably a better choice for you than IB, but ultimately it's kind of up to you. Moving on to the next con, everyone pulls an all-nighter at least once. The number of times kind of depends on you, but I don't know anyone who didn't pull an all-nighter or their own equivalent of an all-nighter. It's not that you have terrible time management, it's just that probably at some point in IB you will have IAs, EEs, exams, and college applications all do at the same time, and that will probably temporarily stress you out a lot. This may negatively affect your college applications, depending on how good you are at time management and 
where you plan on applying as the deadlines will differ, which is why I highly recommend you self-reflect on your stress tolerance and your time management skills prior to making any final decisions. This next one is definitely also a pro as aforementioned, but you have to be super independent. If you always rely on other people for the answers or you just regurgitate information that was already in a textbook, you're definitely not gonna do very well in IB because the IB doesn't value that. I know this is kind of part of the whole IB mentality that they try to propagate among their students, but you have to be an independent thinker. Simply regurgitating information that someone else already said won't garner you high marks and you won't do well ultimately if that is the type of studying that you have done in the past, which is something that in contrast is valued very highly in certain other high school programs. Even on your IAs, independent thinking is literally graded in the marking criteria personal engagement, which grades how creative your research is. In IB, you have to be independent in a lot of ways. You have to be an independent thinker, you have to be independent in terms of finding your own resources and materials, you have to be independent in terms of time management, and many, many other things. Again, this is a trait to be learned, and I know several people who entered IB saying they weren't particularly independent but left being relatively independent. Nevertheless, to a certain degree, I think you need to already be independent when you enter IB. Moving on to con number six. To put it like my brother said, you will most likely be hit like a truck by a subject that you were not expecting. You can totally work your way back from this and I wouldn't worry about it too much. Nevertheless, you'll likely score relatively badly in a subject you weren't expecting in your first semester of IB or first year of IB, which could dent your GPA slightly, but on the plus side, I think it's very reflective of the fact that you're actually learning stuff that's quite difficult sometimes. Moving on to the final con, IB will be your entire life for two years, or well, it will consume the majority of your life at least for two years, or maybe even three if you're doing pre-IB as well. <laughs> it's natural that as a high school student, you'll probably discuss high school at some point because that's what you spend a good chunk of your life on, just like if you attend university, you'll probably talk about what you learned about in class. However, the problem that comes with IB is that oftentimes you'll have to sacrifice something to stay on top of your IB course loads. I presume most of you have already seen this Bermuda Triangle before. The idea is that you can't have all three, which is very appropriate for IB in my opinion. Even students that are absolutely excellent at time management eventually end up having to sacrifice either social life, sleep, or academics. IB is a lot of work no matter what school you go to. However, in my experience, IB definitely was more time consuming at the private school I attended compared to the public school I attended. And this seems to be a trend from what I've heard from other students. My guess is this is mostly the result of the aspect that private schools tend to be more organized and therefore they'll track your homework more. And on top of that, they'll probably assign more homework to ensure that you actually grasp the concepts, which is less so the case in public schools as teachers tend to be slightly less invested in students' well-being, in my experience anyways, because they simply don't have the time to care about every single student individually as they tend to take on much larger classes. You can clear up part of your schedule for sure, but if you want to do well in IB, you'll probably have to skip a movie night with friends here and there, quit a club, or sleep deprive yourself like I did, <laughs> which may not have been the best choice. Overall, this was definitely the thing I hated most about IB, and I get the feeling that most other high school programs only have this to a lesser degree, which is a massive pro if you do end up choosing a different high school program. But then again, you lose all of the good things about IB as well. Moving on to things I wish someone had told me before I entered IB. These are somewhat unrelated to the is IB worth it question, but they're very useful IB advice and tips to consider, at least in my opinion they are, so I thought I would talk about them if you feel like watching this part of a video and are still here. Firstly, I would recommend considering not doing the full IB and instead doing IB courses. If I had done my exchange year in France one year earlier, I honestly would have switched schools entirely to do a mix between AP and IB or solely IB classes and not the TOK and EE because I personally think that would have been so much more beneficial to me. I honestly would have done my extracurriculars anyways and CAS simply added busy work to my schedule that was super unnecessary and did not teach me a thing. Except for that voice recording your cast reflections is much faster than anything else so go do that guys i also don't feel as though tok expanded my mind at all in fact i would go so far as to say that it made me think in a very, very narrow way when it came to completing my TOK assignments. Due to the way the TOK marking criteria are set up, I did have some really interesting debates in my TOK classes and generally explored some very interesting topics. However, 
in general, taking solely IB courses would have allowed me to take a second additional IB class, which I think I would have preferred because the classes themselves are super, super interesting. And if you don't do the full IB diploma, it frees up time for you to spend doing other things that you enjoy or just relieve some of the stress from high school if that's something you would prefer instead. <laughs> don't quote me on this, but my understanding is that at least for American universities, most schools don't care at all if you did IB courses or if you did the full IB diploma. And from experience, I can also tell you, you usually don't get any credit for TOK and you definitely don't get credit for CAS <laughs> or your extended essay. So if the unis you intend to apply and go to don't care, I would definitely recommend at least considering this route. This was not a possibility for me to do at my school in Germany, which is why I didn't end up doing this. But if your school offers it, I would recommend you look into this. Secondly, if your school offers it, I would highly recommend recommend you look into the anticipated category. I really want to stress this because this is so incredibly beneficial to you. The anticipated category essentially allows you to take certain IB exams after your first year in the IB. This doesn't work for most subjects and this doesn't exist in all schools. In fact, I think it doesn't exist in the majority of schools. However, if your school does offer it, I would definitely recommend you take whatever you can under the anticipated category. This is because it provides you with three major, major advantages. Firstly, you can potentially reduce your workload for year two, which will remove some of those nice all-nighters from your life and also probably allow you to focus more on college applications in year two. I know some people who did three courses in year one and three courses in year two, just because their courses lended themselves to doing this. This is unlikely to be the case for many subjects. For example, the sciences generally aren't done in one year because it just has too much content. So it's very difficult to do the sciences under the anticipated category and most schools won't offer this. But a lot of humanities will be offered under the anticipated category if your school offers it. So if you're heavy on humanities, this might be super, super nice for you. The second advantage it provides is that if you mess up on your exams, you don't have to spend an entire year year wasting your life just studying to make up for that one exam. Also, I believe it's not really seen as a negative if you take the exam under anticipated and mess up simply because you took the exam a year early anyways, so you were going through the material faster to begin with. What some people will even do is take SL exams year one and then take the HL exams for the same subject year two, and this will allow them the choice between two grades when they apply to college in a lot of cases which could be nice. The third reason I recommend you do this, and possibly even the most important reason, is that you really get a feel for what IB exams are like. For example, even though I didn't take the May 2020 IB exam because they got canceled and that whole IB scandal happened, the fact that I took my May 2018 exam for economics meant I knew exactly what I was getting myself into for the May 2020 exams, and I already was very mentally prepared for what was going to happen on exam day. It just relaxes you a lot more because it's not the first time you're taking exams and you already sort of have the routine down a little bit. Therefore, if you have that option, definitely go check it out. Personally, I think this was one of the best things I did in IB and I would highly recommend, even if you don't feel prepared to take the exams, go take the exams because it's just super useful. Also, even if your school doesn't offer the anticipated category, I would recommend you go talk to your IB coordinator and see if it's maybe possible for you to do it anyways. Again, because it is so incredibly helpful to you. <laughs> Finally, I wanted to say that if you're aiming at applying to the UK or German universities, your IAs are the most important thing you do throughout your two years. Whereas if you're applying to the US, your predicted grades add GPA are the more important factor. This is one of the things I really wish someone had told me before I started IB because it's such a small but incredibly important piece of information to know. And this mostly has to do with the way that the university application system is set up in the two areas. In the UK, if you're accepted into university, you still have an offer that you have to meet to actually be accepted into university. For example, if you're accepted into UCL, your offer might be 39 points. So when you go to write your final IB exams, you have to score 39 points if you want to attend UCL, otherwise they will withdraw your acceptance in 90% of cases. In contrast, in the US you apply to university 
with the transcripts of your last four years of high school. And the universities will then generally recalculate a GPA based on those grades that you received and then accept or reject you based on those grades and the other parts of your application that go to the university. The acceptances and rejections pretty much all occur prior to your final IV exams. Therefore, the deciding factor in terms of grades in your university acceptance in the US is not your final IV score, but your predicted IV score and your previous courses and grades on your transcripts. In rare cases, American universities may withdraw your acceptance if your final IV score isn't close enough to your predicted IV scores. But from what I understand, this is super, super rare. And I personally know multiple people who have dropped five or six points and still didn't get rejected, including one person who got accepted into the Ivy League. So it seems super uncommon, honestly. Now I'm not recommending you do this because ideally you do not wind up in the situation, but if you're super, super desperate, always, always, always pick your IA if you're applying to UK universities because it's the only actual thing that contributes to your final IB scores that you do throughout your two years in IB. If you don't do a homework assignment here or there in order to finish your IAs, that's okay. You'll probably wind up with a slightly lower predicted grade, but an overall higher final IV score, which is for the most part what you're aiming for if you're aiming for the UK. If you're aiming for the US, ditch your IAs in order to maintain your GPA and predicted grades because those are what determine your university acceptance for the most part in terms of grades. Again, I don't recommend you wind up in this situation, but if you do, I'm just saying. In conclusion, overall, my personal IB experience definitely had more positives than negatives, which is why I would personally definitely redo IB if I could actually sit the exams instead of having a weird IB algorithm screw up our entire cohort. That being said, I definitely don't think IB is worth it for everyone, and there are a variety of different IB routes that I personally didn't necessarily have the option to do, but that some of you might have the option to do, which may be a better combination than simply doing the full IB diploma. For example, if you intend to go to art school, taking subjects from five other subject groups that you're probably not going to do much with in the future may not be the best investment of your time. And you might benefit more from doing a different high school program that allows you more time to focus on actually practicing your art and gaining skills in that field. I do think you learn a lot in IB and it can be super, super interesting, but I definitely think you need to know what you're getting yourself into before you get yourself into it because, you know, it's kind of like a no turning back kind of situation. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this Is Ivy Really Worth It video and hopefully these Ivy pros and cons helped answer the questions should I take full IV? If you did enjoy this Ivy advice video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe or well, at least do that if you feel like doing that. And feel free to check out any of the other Ivy advice video or fashion content I have made if that is something you're interested in. If you have further Ivy video suggestions or Ivy questions you want answered, feel free to comment them down below and I will do my best to answer all of your questions. Have an awesome day and don't cry your way through Ivy if you decide to take this. You can definitely do this. You just gotta pull through. Bye!